cool. All right. <laughs> so at Lightspeed, we love partnering with extraordinary founders, including in gaming, people like you. Um, we're now managing almost $30 billion across 13 global offices, including an increasing European presence in London, in Berlin, in Paris, and in Tel Aviv. Really excited to share the stage today with two gaming legends. So, Hilmar, Michael, maybe talk a little bit about your background and the games you're working on right now. Uh, yes, I am Hilmar Vero Pietson. I'm the CEO of CCP. We're mostly known for EVE Online, uh, which is celebrating its 20-year uh, anniversary today, or this year. Congratulations. Uh, happened in okay. May. Um, and we were uh, in September busy announcing our third decade plans. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's me. Um, I'm Michael Chow. I'm the CEO of The Believer Company. Um, if you've played any games of mine before, it would either be um, Words with Friends, uh, which is from my first company, New Toy, um, or uh, League of Legends in particular on mobile and console, which was sort of the terminal point of my journey with my second company, um, which I sold to Riot. Um, and uh, The Believer Company is my third company, which makes it seem like I enjoy starting games companies. I, <laughs> um, it's pretty nice when you have a phenomenal investor like Moritz and Lightspeed here. But, oh my um, god. Uh, but our focus is on making what we would call next generation open world games. Awesome. And we want to talk today about the intersection of gaming and AI. Um, Michael, maybe we start with the most important people in this conversation, the players. So how do they feel about generative AI? What are they looking forward to? What are some of their biggest concerns? Yeah, so, I mean, AI, so I think it's the right question, first of all, is like, what do players care about? Uh, to me, some of the hype trains we've had in games in the past, um, like Web3 and, um, I, yeah, sort of a bundle of probably things. probably throw the metaverse in there too. A bundle, yeah. yeah, a bundle of things around that had uh, sort of a dearth or an absence of players really caring about it. Um, AI is interesting in that players are pretty passionate. I think they're pro and, pro and con. Uh, the pro part is like players want big, rich, deep games that are really huge, and they think that AI can help us do that. Um, and um, that's a good example. Like, there's this fascinating debate this year about Baldur's Gate 3, where it's this really huge and rich game, and uh, players loved it. And then some developers online came out and they were like, please don't hold us to the Baldur's Gate expectation going forward, um, which I thought was kind of crazy. Um, but, uh, but it's sort of this, it, players have this desire for really big and deep and rich games, and um, even indie games, like Baldur's Gate is somehow an indie game at this point. Um, they want us to be able to sort of do that more easily. Uh -huh. um, I think the downside, the thing that, that they don't want is they just don't want us to fuck it up. <laughs> they don't want us to make bad games by, by using technology that makes the games more mediocre, and that is the fear that players have. Uh -huh. um, the converse example I'd use is if anybody's been following um, the Silent Hill, the new Silent Hill sort of interactive experience, um, where the writing is so terrible that the players think that it was written by AI, <laughs> and then the, 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 CEO, the CEO of the company had to come out and say publicly, no, we didn't, like, only human beings wrote the story and the script. Um, but that's players' expectations, is that they can, they can either be great or it can be terrible. And um, yeah, we have to, our job is to sort of navigate it in between. Awesome. Um, and Hilmar, like, kind of piggybacking a little bit on this, like one of the firm beliefs at Lightspeed that we have is that in a platform shift like the introduction of AI and kind of like drawing an analogy to the emergence of the internet, the introduction of the mobile phone, we believe that the companies that will knock it out of the park are the ones that build completely novel, previously impossible experiences versus just incrementally improving you know, dev tooling, workflows, which is actually where we see most startups today is, is in that space. And we're kind of like trying to fish elsewhere. So if we, if we think bold, like what do you think are some of these magical, unprecedented experiences that players will now have with the help of AI? 
So um, <clears throat> maybe piggybacking a little bit on the, uh, on the conversation you were starting is that, so we who make games, um, we, um, we talk a lot amongst ourselves about like um, the cost of them, the risk of them, the tools that can increase the odds of success. It's a lot of risk mitigation because there's a part of making games which is a bat on a creative vision backed on the ability to execute, etc. So, and we have this tendency of then take our sausage making on stage and talk about like, now we're putting this one ingredient in this sausage, and now it's AI, we're putting AI in the sausage. And I, I think generally gamers just don't really care. They just want the sausage. They yeah. don't really want to see the sausage factory. It's like, I'm sure the sausage factory is uh, under control, but please don't show it to me. <laughs> So, but we're always taking our sausage factory on stage and being shocked that uh, now that people see the ingredients, they have like massive opinions about the ingredient. It shouldn't be AI, it shouldn't be blockchain, it shouldn't be DirectX, it shouldn't be a PlayStation. Like all these ingredient talk we sometimes do, and then we're surprised that people don't like talking about it b because they really don't. They just like to, to play the game or eat the sausages. They don't really care so much as we do how they are made exactly. So we then take your question into it, okay, what are people really looking for? I think most games are a form of power fantasies. So I want to imbue players with some abilities they don't have in the real world. And I, when I play a game, I usually want to grow in uh, ability. Or, uh, most games are some kind of mastery journeys. I'm playing with a little sword, I would like a big sword. I can jump a little distance, I can jump a, a big distance. And now I'm learning the game, through mastery of the game, I gain more power. So when we take something like AI and what it could potentially do, it could, uh, in its kind of fully final form, maybe provide ultimate power fantasies where it is really reading from my input what I really want to do as a power fantasy. Um, I mean, I want to be a wizard. Um, I want to be a wizard who doesn't I mean, you're almost there. Yeah, I want, to, I want to make a fireball in my hand. And back to the sausage making, um, making that happen for people with the sort of sausage factories we have today um, is very expensive, it's very unforeseen. But I think the promise is that if I as a player am interfacing with something that can mold my universe in accordance to my imagination, which you kind of see in kind of the mid-journey loop of like, when you're alone with mid-journey, it's a big, powerful experience, and then you show somebody else what you did to mid-journey, and they don't care about it, but I do care about it. I like it a lot. This is my imagination. But rendering that in the format of a game where I really could just make a fireball, and it happens exactly as I expected it to, because there was a magic AI reading my desires and rendering to me in real time, in a unique way to me. I mean, it looks like you want to react to that a, li a little bit too, and maybe I know you have strong perspectives on that because you know one one thing we also always try and figure out is not just where will value be created, but who does it accrue to, and you know here as well we try and draw analogies to previous platform shifts. If we look at the introduction of the mobile phone, for example, a lot of the value ultimately in accrued to incumbents. Um, it also created new companies, including uh, local superstars like Supercell and, uh, and Rovio. You can, you can add into this category, but you know, with, with this like, bold risk-taking, even in the, in the, you know, back in the factory, um, who is best equipped to win uh, this AI battle? Is it the startups or is it the incumbents? And maybe I'll, I'll just throw the startup uh, perspective to you, and then maybe, Hilmar, you can make a case for the incumbents. So the first thing I'd say is, I'm not sure I agree. So obviously, I think it's the startups. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we started uh, Believer as an independent company, rather than staying within Riot, for example. Um, so I think it's startups. I'll explain why. But I, I don't wholly agree with the premise yet, and it connects, because um, I think the mobile revolution was very important for gaming. I do think a lot of it accrued to the incumbents, but it was over the course of making big companies that sold you know, to the incumbents. I mean, you know, the Microsoft's 
acquisition of ABK is partly, you know, a part of, you know, King being acquired by Activision Blizzard in the first place, and the fact that they've built a pretty enduring mobile business there. Um, so anyway, the reason I think there is strength in specifically for AI for startups is structurally, I mean, it's mostly a pretty classic innovator's dilemma problem. I think if you want to get AI right in, for game development, in my opinion, you need to have the right people, you need to have the right organizational structure, the creative workflows that correspond to that or organizational structure, the right financial structure, and the right company culture. I think, to make it all work well, because the metaphor that we use often is Pixar. Pixar was not just a movie company, they were a serious technology company that had to invent new ways of making movies based on the technology that was available to them. We have to kind of do the same thing in games. And, and the risk is, with too much of the existing structure, and in a lot of cases, maybe the wrong people, I think it's really hard to take full advantage of the technology to make games. Um, the example I'd give is, my last team in League of Legends was a 1,300-person team. We had two senior technical artists on that team for 1,300 people. At Believer, we have two technical art directors for a 50-person team. And that's kind of like, that's what the balance needs to be for us, certainly at this point. And so I think, as a startup, when you can start from a clean slate and you can build the right people into the culture, you can build the culture around them, the workflows and the organizational structure to support it, then you can take full advantage of how to do games in a completely new way. Whereas, I think it's a lot harder to do it as, you know, as a larger incumbent company. And that's my, my perspective. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think there are two general activities in businesses. There is like the exploration of something, finding something new, and there is the exploitation of it, uh, make an industry That's out of it. That's how I look at life in general. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, th this, this is what it's about. And, um, and any, any cycle is a mixture of both. I mean, you need to explore new things, discover them, and then you need to scale them up and deliver at mass. You mentioned Pixar. Pixar is a great example. They explore this element. Where does it scale up? It scales up through Disney. Um, Supercell, uh, local rock star, very similar journey. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it is uh, a mixture. So um, um, I'm excited for both. Uh, there is an aspect with AI, but it's such a broad term that, OK, that might be a platform. It might be an ingredient. It might be many things. And it is many things. So there is a lot of refinement capability in it. I already see it at my company. We don't really have to do much. Um, our people at CCP are just taking various AI techniques and just uh, doing greater work in their current jobs. Um, and I think that is a very unusual aspect of, of, of technology disruptions, mm -hmm. that this is led very much by just the people individually learning how to do things, mm -hmm. whether it's code pilot for code, whether it's a uh, mid-journey and stable diffusion for inspiration and managing sort of ideation and all these things, uh, chat GPT for a lot of just, even just internal communication that just becomes better, where you have kind of a sort of at scale editor for everything you do. So um, <clears throat> I think there is an aspect where a lot of the sort of value out of this is just captured through people just having better tools to do their current jobs um, and then kind of do better work or, or more work. Uh, 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 both things are happening. Uh, but it is overall uh, leading to an increase in quality. You mentioned co-pilots. I want to drill down on that. Um, we also see this bifurcation of some uh, tools focusing on design time, others on runtime. It kind of like plays a little bit into, you know, some developers, uh, game designers, being extremely excited about runtime AI and um, the ability to create uh, intelligent NPCs or emergent behaviors, branching narrative. Um, but others wanting more creative control and ultimately a tighter grip on the final product. Like, do you? 
Is this a false dichotomy to say what will win, like design time AI, runtime AI? Do you, do you think we'll have both? Like, what's your take on that? It, it's a false dichotomy. Like the, um, so um, if we take a look at, for example, our game, Eve Online. Um, <coughs> Eve Online, uh, the star map of Eve Online was made with a generative process. Um, it was a procedural system that uh, ran a Big Bang simulation and through sort of crystal accretion grew the whole world based on design primitives. And it literally was sort of a, the solar systems were walking around the generative structures to find their place in the universe. Uh, it was a generative algorithm. Uh, it wasn't based on machine learning, but it was a generative algorithm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that allowed us, a small team in Iceland of 30 people, to make 5,000 solar systems that were all astronomically accurate based on our based understanding of the world at the time. So we used the generative process to do kind of creativity at scale, uh, because if we were to have done it manually, it actually, in a way, loses creativity, because like manually placing 5,000 systems, you at some point are just repeating yourself. Nobody has the creativity to make 5,000 unique systems. So that's an example of like using generative methods, whether they're AI, machine learning, neural networks, whatever they are, but they are generating an output based on creative inputs. Uh, and that is a good thing, and that will just continue from even online to whatever means people are using today. When you come to the runtime effect, then also games are obviously famously for using runtime methods, which aren't language models, but they, they used to be called AI. NPCs in A Online are exhibiting some degree of intelligence. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of intelligence attributed to them, even if you look at how they actually behave. Uh, maybe not like that intelligence, but we have such an ability to attribute human traits onto many different things. We say insects are angry and, and things like that. So I think, I mean, it's a false dichotomy. Both things are very valid. And shockingly, both things are very familiar. Again, Eve Online, made with a generative process, currently uses very primitive AI methods to have NPCs. Both these things will get better through these methods. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk not just about the technology, but also the, the culture and the leadership that's necessary to implement AI. And Michael, I know you thought about this. Like, what's your take on AI culture? Like, what do you think is required for teams to really be successful in this new world? Yeah, th so this is one of the reasons I think, I <laughs> think um, insurgents have an advantage is that you get the time and the cycles to really crank on this part of it. It's really hard. I, I will say that um, I think most developers, we st still don't really have their heads wrapped around what the potential is. We won't for a few years. Like, in my opinion, it was maybe last year that game developers as a community got like a B or a B minus on mobile, right? So I think it's going to take us a really long time to get there with AI. And, and a lot of the culture crafting is done in this context where um, there's sort of like a, there's a lot of um, ongoing kind of nastiness between um, technologists who I think come off as really um, insensitive to creatives and creatives who come off as really Luddite uh, to technologists. And, and so one of the things that we do to cultivate that at Believer, there's like two things in particular. The first is what we call hands-on curiosity. So we, we mandate that everybody spends 40 hours in the thing that you hate. So if you're an, a concept artist or you're an illustrator and you think mid-journey is terrible and it's evil and it will never be good for you, by the way, that's pr like we probably won't use mid-journey. Still, you have to go <laughs> and sit down and spend 40 hours cranking through it to really understand the depth of it. Um, it's not, to, not even in the, the ordinary course of your work, but just to deeply understand what's, what the capacity is and understand how the technology might help you. Um, so that's one thing is we, we require that people get hands-on and they open their hearts and minds to things that they otherwise think might be really bad. Um, the second thing is it's a general, what we call intellectual pluralism. It's, if you've read the Brene Brown book, um, 
uh, Dare to Lead. It's kind of this, the idea of, of daring leadership, which is fundamentally, it's vulnerable and it's open-hearted and open-minded. And um, that is a core part of it too. And we actually sort of do some active practice around how do we get people being comfortable like debating with one another in a way that is very sharp, but is also very loving, very respectful. Um, how do you learn how to change your mind? How do you recognize your, when you have your own bias? Um, because to use a Bre Brene Brownism, we're not here to be right, we're here to get it right. And making sure that everybody has that mindset and we cultivate it in how we work together is really important. But it's also really hard. Most people don't want to be, they don't, <laughs> most people want to win arguments and they want to feel righteous. And even when we have a really strict way of bringing people into the company and, and recruiting based on the right culture, we're all human beings and we still have some of these same challenges. So. I, I love what you said recently about playing to win versus playing to not lose. Yes. Ta talk to us about that. Yeah, so I, I think that the, in this space, um, I think that it's very, very easy to play to avoid failure. And it's, it's easier for big companies to do that because that's a core part of what you have to do. Like the example that we use is relevant to us is Grand Theft Auto 6 cannot be very good, much better than Grand Theft Auto 5. It can't be. They, have to, they cannot lose with that franchise. They cannot destroy that franchise. There's a lot of play, player value caught up in it. And so they kind of have to play to not lose to some degree versus playing to win, which is taking really huge risks and trying to create disruptive value. And um, like, you know, GTA 6 is, you know, it's been 10 years, over 10 years since GTA 5. So it's really hard for them to, to make it that much better. Um, and I, it's a tough position for them to be in, but, um, but yeah, I, it, like, yeah, I don't envy it. <laughs> I don't envy that position. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're early stage investors because we share that yeah, yeah. sentiment and hopefully come out on the right end of it. Um, Hilmar, uh, what do you and your leadership team do personally to prepare yourselves and, and be best equipped for this new AI landscape? Mm. Uh, I think generally training oneself and the culture of the company uh, in curiosity. I think curiosity Uh, really is the path to all innovation and, and uh, uh, to all changes. If you're not curious about something different, um, then it's very hard to change. So I think uh, curiosity is kind of a winning strategy of like maintaining that uh, as the company becomes older and bigger and all those variables. How can you maintain curiosity? And again, to this element of AI usage at CCP, it's very much driven by curiosity from just everyone throughout the company. It's not some big corporate strategy that we, we should all go and do some AI stuff. It's just we can trust the company to be curious. And, um, and that, in my experience, has been a much more productive way uh, to innovate. It's just to lean into the curiosity of everyone at the company, that kind of sort of filters in or it filters out. Um, often when you're CEO in a company, then you want to set strategies and directions and all that. And of course, there is a part of it. But uh, as they say, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So if you have a healthy amount of curiosity in your company, generally you can trust it to uh, sort of move to the, to, the, to the right direction that makes sense. Obviously within some boundaries and constraints, But uh, once you have said that, then curiosity is a, is a very powerful thing. Um, then there is a, a, a general thing I've seen both with gamers and game developers, is that they have this beautiful ability to hold two opposing thoughts in their brains at the same time. They don't like the status quo and the hate chains <laughs> at the same time. Um, and, 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 and human beings can't do that. People are always in contradiction with oneself. We have two logical impossibilities um, uh, in our brain all the time. It, and it happens all the time. Sometimes people are criti critiquing 
each other about not being consistent, but we never are. We can just really be in this state of like hating the status quo and hating change at the same time. And often the path through that, and we have learned this from decades of interacting with uh, uh, EVE players, is more about showing rather than telling. Like every time you're trying to explain people about some very abstract concept that's in the sausage factory somewhere here and how everything is going to be better if we just have that, it's just like, I don't like that. But I also don't like exactly what I have right now. I want that to change also. And the best way to do that is just to live, deliver things and have people play with them, rather than to be talking about them endlessly and how it's going to be awesome once we have this new piece of ingredients which now magically is going to get everything better. It's about like talking about chili versus just tasting it. Um, so, um, yeah, I would bring that. Curiosity and people have the ability to both hate the status quo and not liking change at the same time. You know, while we're already segueing into more touchy-feely topics, and while we hold you captive on stage here for another five minutes or so, um, I want to I wanna go a bit more vulnerable and authentic. You even mentioned vulnerability. Um, if you could reflect on this almost past year of 2023, where do you think you failed as a leader? And, and what are some resolutions for you going forward? And I'll start with you, Michael. Uh, yeah, this one is sharp for me because I've been <laughs> feeling it maybe for a few months. Um, y like even answering some of the questions today, you can feel I have like a little intensity um, to how how I feel about people who are sort of like not adopting this really, like not being proactive, being entrenched in their own thoughts, not being sufficiently curious, not listening to other people. And I've spent a few times this year being kind of like disappointed Asian dad to a lot of, a lot of um, folks on the team who are struggling with it in that way. Um, I, it's, and, and it's not the place that I naturally come from. Um, the, it's a little bit, to be honest, uh, like a technique I acquired in my last role because of that 1,300 person team, about 1,000 of those people were Chinese developers in the Tencent is ecosystem, um, various sister studios, and there's a book called Culture Map, which I recommend to anybody. If you're ever doing any cross-cultural co-development, strongly recommend this book. I love it and I hate it because one of the things I learned from it is in, <laughs> in Eastern knowledge work cultures, you, you can't always use love and inspiration. You have to use disappointment and you have to sort of anchor the emotions around that and you have to use um, like very hierarchical mandates um, to get the job done. And I think I kind of adopted that. That's like a mode that I added to myself over the course of working on League of Legends in, in, for like six years. And, um, and I kind of like, I get caught in that mode a little bit. And as it pertains to this work, where I think we have a bright future and I see people dragging on actually realizing the future, I kind of get disappointed Asian dad mode. Um, <laughs> And I can, I, I'm, I need to work on that. What about you, Helma? So, um, it's the downside of being a CEO is that the mistakes you make often don't really reveal themselves until much later. Uh, it would be a very easy job if there was more immediate reinforcement. And I do miss my development days when I was a game developer, I was making a 3D engine, especially making a 3D engine. It's a very close reinforcement loop. When you make uh, the right thing and the wrong thing, it's like visible in a span of days and weeks. But when you're a CEO, it's a span of months and years. So um, if I now, especially in light of the fact that Eve is turning 20 years old, um, probably my biggest mistake in my 20 years um, well, yeah, 20 years of being CEO, is not to have started the intern program sooner. Um, the, uh, we live on a tiny island called Iceland. There's only 300,000 people there. When we start, there are no game developers. Now, 20 years later, we have amazing game developers, which are natural born within CCP. But if I were to have kept the intern program as almost like a talent pipeline over those 20 years, the, 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 the scale of the talent base and the footprint 
the human footprint of a company would be much bigger. So uh, if you're running a company, make sure your intern program is robust. I think with that, we're on time. Maybe one conclusion is that uh, with AI or not, even building games is still a people business and needs to be treated as such. It is that. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank you. Us. Thanks, you guys.